Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the fourth event in our Border Literature series. Border Literatures was co-curated by the National Library of Ireland and Professor Nicholas Allen in association with the Wilson Centre for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia. Border Literatures is a reading and conversation series designed to share diverse literary perspectives on the experience of living in, crossing through and reflecting on the century that has passed since the partition of the island of Ireland. Tonight, our panel will be discussing Guard Your Heart by Sue Devon, a young adult love story across the divide set in Derry in 2016. Guard Your Heart was shortlisted for the Caledonia Award in 2019 and was the winner of the Irish Writers' Centre Novel Fair. Uh, the author, Sue Devon, is joining us tonight, joining our panel, along with Dr. Don Miranda Sharat Bedeau. And also we have uh, Nicholas Allen, as our moderator for this evening. So uh, thank you all everybody for joining us and I'll hand over to Nicholas uh, to get started. Thanks Ruth and good evening everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you here and what a treat to be with Don and Sue to talk about Sue's wonderful book, Guard Your Heart, which I've been reading with great pleasure and enjoyment and has me full of questions and I'm sure we will have great conversation. Just before we started, I wanted to say thank you very much to Ruth and to Breed O'Sullivan, who's also on this call, for their adding to their already busy day by coming and help us host this conversation. I'm talking to you from the east coast of a slightly sunny and snowy United States, so I appreciate all of you turning up on an Irish winter's evening to come and discuss this beautiful book about a very complicated, uh, dense, troublesome terrain that is treated with real skill and empathy and understanding. So, Sue, I'm really looking forward to talking about your book this evening. Thank you. And I'm really delighted that I'm going to begin talking about it with Don. And Don is one of our best younger critics who has really helped many of us understand what this emerging Northern Irish literary expression has become over the last two decades. I left Belfast a long time ago now, and it's been a pleasure for me to read Dawn's work and to understand her perceptions, her many different perspectives from different perspectives um, about what these works mean, how they speak to each other, and also the consistent work for which I want to applaud her now of lifting up the voices and works of writers who perhaps don't fit into traditional canons, poetry, prose, fiction, in the way that we've thought of it, I think, over the years as a kind of Northern tradition and really enriched all of our reading lives for it. So Don, thank you for that. So, you. so I'm going to ask you a question in a moment about your wonderful book and where it came from and what you were thinking about. But I thought that since we have Don here and we're lucky to have her, that maybe I would just ask you, would you mind this book published in 2021 set in 2016 begins in a way at the very end of the 20th century with two characters who are born just as the Belfast Agreement itself comes to life. Would you mind just giving us a broad sense for everyone who's joined us this evening, and you're all very welcome, about what literature from the north of Ireland has looked like over the last 10, 20 years, what you think the themes are? Why is it different from what came before? Sure. Well, thank you for that very lovely, generous commentary and intro, Nicholas. Um, re yeah, really delighted to be here. Very excited to meet Sue and talk about her book, uh, which I've greatly, greatly enjoyed. Um, the, the sort of YA genre is something that I've been looking at more. I'm very interested in kind of coming of age narratives. And I think that's something that we've seen talking about kind of more recent developments. I think we're hearing about young people, young adults, and uh, what it means to come of age for these, you know, as Lyra McKee called them, the ceasefire babies, the ceasefire generation. And that's something that really struck me about Sue's book. And, you know, because I was prepping for this and I was looking back at some some earlier Joan Lingard books and, and trying to think about, you know, how things have developed and how things have changed. Um, and I think within that framework of talking about coming of age narratives, um, a, another strand that I've noticed in kind of contemporary northern writing is, of course, the explosion of northern women writers. And um, so it's so exciting to see this kind of crossover effect of women YA writers who are having this kind of broad appeal. And that's something that I thought about in terms of this book. I mean, it's a pretty meaty text. It's a sizable novel. And when I was reading over the, Jean, the Joan Lingard books, you know, they're quite slim, actually. And I, certainly she packs a lot into it. But I thought that this, um, 
there was this shift into this kind of nitty gritty of kind of a young adult experience. And that's something that we've seen obviously with uh, Milkman by Anna Burns, um, Dairy Girls, you know, there, this is something that um, feels sort of new, uh, you know, and, and I think also looking at kind of more difficult topics, um, more topics that used to be considered taboo. And, and that's something that um, also is, I think, quite fresh. And um, we're also seeing just uh, kind of multifaceted experience, um, thinking about, you know, we're hearing a lot more about queer coming of age experiences as well. And so all of that is really exciting. And um, that's something that I think is kind of distinguishing this post-agreement fiction and certainly there is that post-conflict context, um, but oftentimes it's kind of hovering in the background. I mean, it is always there, um, but it's not always at the center. And I think it, it's certainly a framework for, for Sue's book, but it's also looking at two people. It's looking at a love story. And, um, you know, so yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm going on a bit, but um, yeah, so those are the kinds of things that, uh, sort of jumped out at me in that context. That's where, and brilliant about Gary Girls and brilliant about Milkman, the book I actually find the most I don't know, psychologically apt of any of these fictions. It seemed to me a, a kind of Ulysses for Belfast for the 21st mm -hmm. century. Said things that were only ever, not even thought, but almost pre-conscious in the background. But thinking back to the, that earlier time you said about, you know, talking about the taboo, it seems to me almost that everything was taboo in yeah. Ireland in the 1980s and 1990s. And I was really struck in Sue's book so you have a lovely line in it, you'll never hear if you're scared to listen. And I wondered if you wouldn't mind sharing with us and in context of what Sue said, but just about why did you, or when, when and why did you feel you wanted to speak? And why did you choose this form of a book to speak to people? Um, well, the, the sort of literary answer, I suppose, is better than, than the, the answer that might be true or that I just kind of fell into it. Um, so the, the literary answer that I have learned to say is really, I suppose, uh, the context of me writing is very much within my day job. My day job is as a peace and reconciliation worker in, in Derry, London, Derry, Dura. Um, and so in, in 2016, when... I was beginning to think about a story that was mulling in my head. What was happening in the field of peace work at that time was obviously it's common knowledge now, but people would have been talking about the decade of centenaries. And we'd been talking about that for some time, you know, how we would make sure in peace work that the past was used to, uh, you know, create a better future, a shared future for everyone, rather than being manipulated as propaganda used in, in one way. And a lot of principles by ethical and shared remembering came out about that. But really what I remember my brain doing in that process was we were talking about the past and the future and, and my brain kept going, what about the present? You know, who's telling the story of the present? And what about the complexity of where we are now? And, and, and what does that look like? And I, I guess that just came at a time that my brain was beginning to think creatively about, you know, how would you tell that in a story? And, and that's where Aidan and Iona really came out of. And, you know, as I was saying, there is a non-literary answer to the question as well, which is very much, I'm a single parent. And at, at that time, when I started writing in 2016, my son was a lot younger than he is now. And I used to find myself stuck in the house in the evenings. And I'd, I'd had a few years of, of watching pretty much everything on telly and I was bored mindless with it. And I just thought there must be something better I can do with my time. So switched the telly off and started writing. And this was the story that, that emerged from that. And I guess it was a big learning process of, of how you actually do that. And, and that took several years. Um, you know, so interestingly, it ended up being published on another key decade or another key year in that decade of centenaries, you know, the sort of centenary of partition or the creation of Northern Ireland, whether it's a party or a wake, it kind of, that, that was when it came out. Um, so that's really it. And I, I suppose... The other thing that having mulled it over, you know, the way a lot of writers say, sometimes you're putting something on a page and you don't really know where it's coming from until it's there. And then you sit back and you say, well, what was that all about? And I think 
I, I have also come to the opinion that in, in my childhood, growing up in the Troubles, um, I wasn't brought up in a particularly one-sided community or family. I was brought up in a family where, although we were actually from a Presbyterian tradition, it was really broad-minded. A lot of the music and cultural things I, I did were very cross-community, even at the height of the Troubles. Um, and so the environments that I mixed in were really diverse, but sometimes I was very much a minority in some environments like learning Ellen Pipes, for example, which sounded like strangling a cat at the time. And, uh, you know, it, but places like that, I learned how to keep quiet and how to listen. And the same thing happened when I went into my professional life because I started out being a teacher. And as a teacher, you're trying to get the pupils to think and learn. It's not about you telling them your opinion and then I moved into the field of peace work where you're in a facilitator role and again it's never about my opinion it's about working with diverse communities and bringing them to consensus or sharing ideas and so my voice was always not there in it and I think that's what I've come to the conclusion is that I write because it is an expression of stuff that I've learned and want to say but mainly it's because I want to see if I can make other people think. Well, you do beautifully. I mean, as you're speaking, I'm thinking a number of things. Uh, another line that stuck with me when the two characters are with each other, they have no agendas, no masks, just 18 year olds. And I was thinking to myself, what a tremendously difficult thing it would be to uh, imagine writing as if one were an 18 year old when one is no longer so. And things have changed so much, not just historically and politically, but even culturally. Your book is full of Facebook and text messages and all forms of electronic media that were not there even and Joe Lingard's time just didn't make that an immediate comparison. So I was struck with a couple of questions to ask you. One about that sense you had then of, you know, you're, you're translating and the book is full of translation of Irish words and English words and people's experiences to each other. It definitely has that. And then also about your staging, because I thought there was a real gift for and love of landscape in the book. And it's not necessarily the first thing you would think of with it young adult book which is about characters in fraught situations finding each other it's full of beautiful passages the bus ride from Derry to Belfast going over the Glenshean Pass a view I know well the inner sea of Loch May you're looking out over the Peace Bridge and you do that whole declension from the Cregan looking down and you can see the river and out to the estuary and out beyond and then up at the old fort at Grainan and looking out and over the kind of the whole territory of Donegal which I want to ask you more about too so Speak to me a little bit more about translation and finding yourself as a translator and tell me a little bit more about staging, not just of character, but of place. Yeah, okay, well, on the, the, the sort of the, the being, the characters, I got asked what I found was a really funny question from a, a group of teenagers in a local school who asked me, um, was it not wild difficult? How on earth did you write a Catholic? And nobody asked me, how did you write an 18 year old boy? And I just thought, hang on a minute, you know, our sense of where we're at here is just in a whole, you know, for me, I'm just writing people. Um, and I, I've, Aidan's voice just infiltrated my head for a couple of years as, as I wrote this. He, he by far was the easier character for me somehow to empathize with and get on the page. Whereas Iona, I found really difficult. And I think as a writer, you're drawn to the characters that have the most potential for drama, the most risk, you know, that may happen to them because that's when they have to fight back. And clearly in the book, Aidan is the one who is, you know, he's in a life and death scenario there. Iona is facing challenges, there's no doubt, but she's from a slightly more stable family structure and maybe the difficulties are more subtle. You know, um, she's not as broke as Aidan is. There are parents, siblings that, you know, around. So I found her much harder to write authentically. Um, and it was really only in later edits when I suddenly realized I'm going to have to make some more bad stuff happen to her that that she came a bit more alive and started to fight back. Um, in, in terms of the places, um, I, 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 I'm a blow in to Derry. So I grew up in Armagh. And when I first moved to Derry, I just loved the, the place because you have such a compact city with su such amazing cultural history of the walls and Guildhall Square, all very walkable, uh, unlike many other cities. It, it's, it's a condensed place. And because of the, the, 
the mountainous slopes either side of it, the hill structure around it. The views are stunning and, and the foil is just amazing. And then, of course, Donegal on, on the doorstep and the Causeway Coast as well. So, I mean, why would you set every scene in somebody's kitchen when you, when you could actually use that and exploit it? You know, and I guess there was also a sense of with Aidan and Iona, you know, when they were beginning to get to know each other, there was probably a nervous about being seen together in Derry. So it's not surprising, really, that some of their sort of early uh, times together getting to know each other are not in the city where other people would see them. It's a safety mechanism for them. You know, I, I remember an editor asking, you know, well, could you not set one of the, the scenes in a pub for them? And I went, that doesn't work firstly because Iona's not the kind of girl that's going to be hanging out in pubs a lot but also for them to be in a pub together would be a difficult call maybe you know um whereas if they go to the cinema if they go out in a bus run somewhere there's no issue with it so I, I just love the place I live so I, I use it and I'm going to pass over to Don in one minute but I just want to ask you one more thing and I should really really resonating with me now whenever I was reading and thinking about Iona. She's quite a reserved character. Uh, and I can see that now in the way you describe uh, writing her. That makes a lot of sense. You know, one thing we're here to also talk about borders and the crossing of borders. And of course, your book is absolutely about that because at the religious, at the personal, at the social, even at the experiential level, it's all about that and about how far one is willing to trust going with another person in all different kinds of contexts. But you know, it really struck me reading it that it's almost, and this isn't a, a political statement in any way, a kind of post-Northern Ireland novel. It bears the troubles. There are definitely things left there, like Aidan's father, part of him never survived it. There are all of these bits missing. And yet the transit from Derry to Londonderry to Donegal to Belfast to other places again, the sister who calls up from South America, I think I'm right to say, it's all natural and given there's no sense of like a national border or infrastructure it's not the old photographs of the you know ornaments and exclusions and border checks it's past all that and I, maybe brexit has tried to change that again and hopefully failed but would you agree in that sense or, or did you think while you were writing it that actually not only were you writing about young people but you were writing about the start of a new kind of experience which bears the old but isn't the same and maybe isn't freighted in quite the same way I think it is a new story. It's definitely not a Troubles book. It's a post-Troubles book. It is still set very much in a political, historical context, but it, it is a now setting. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, um, really, the whole the Brexit thing, I mean, the vote actually happens in the book, in the timescale of the book, in the June and it only the book only runs through to the August. So really, there was only the start of the inkling of us understanding, you know, uh, in, in a popular sense of, of the impact of that vote. So the border, you know, for people living in Derry, I mean, you know, I, I can see Donegal from where I'm sitting now, if it's daylight, you know, I, I, I walk in places over the border. It's such a fluid place. Um, but perhaps even more than Brexit, uh, COVID made us aware of the border because, of course, the restrictions were different on different sides. So I couldn't go and walk where I always walked every Saturday afternoon anymore because I wasn't allowed to cross the border anymore. And a real sense of claustrophobia actually hit uh, many of us, not maybe everyone, um, but a lot of people really felt the presence of the border, not in a security force manner, but in, in a political, there are different governances and rules now on this, in a way that we hadn't felt it in a very long time. So yeah, I think yeah, uh, my head at the minute, I'm, I'm trying to think forward to what's going to be my third novel uh, coming up, you know, when I start working. On, and, and I very much think I'm going to pick up on borders uh, and the whole COVID scenario, as well as the, the play on Brexit and, and how that has changed the scenario there now. Well, I hope that one will have a happy ending. But, you know, I know, I know. It's, it's YA, you know they have to have a reasonable ending. Well, you, you, do, you do do a brilliant, you really do do a brilliant. But Don, I was going to ask you, and then please um, take the conversation on with Sue afterwards, but just thinking about this, uh, since you're so familiar, more than anyone really, with contemporary Northern literature, if this is a post-Troubles, post-Northern Ireland moment in fiction, what is it a pre of? I know we've got a lot, but what do you think? What's coming? Gosh. That's a really hard question to answer. 
Um, is there any other thing where you thought, I mean, Milkman to me partly is, oh, okay, well, that's the future, but is there anything else you thought? And is there anything in Sue's book that made you think, okay, I see the start of something else? Um, I mean, I think Sue's book sort of leaves that question open because as she was saying, things are still so unsettled with COVID, things are still unsettled with Brexit in a lot of ways. And she had a really great line where she said, um, adults remembered our past, would they ever remember our future? And that one really stuck with me um, because we are in that moment where we're thinking so much about the future generation and what they're going to inherit um, between the, the political contexts that I just mentioned, um, but also obviously the ecological context. Um, so that's something that I think Sue is leaving open for us to think about because, uh, you know, it is the novel is set in this condensed time period and these people, you know, the, the main characters are still getting to know each other. Um, we, we don't have the next part of their story. And so it's, it's left open-ended for us to kind of contemplate uh, their future together and how they're going to make it work. And all of those, those larger issues kind of came into play. And I thought Sue did that really brilliantly. It didn't feel forced at all, these other kinds of contexts, the way that you talked about um, immigrant communities in Derry then featured Syrian refugee characters and, you know, they're just at a, a community barbecue and kind of brought that into the equation I thought was really interesting. And again, that's something that we ha certainly haven't seen in, in YA literature. Um, and so it's interesting hearing about your background in studying European politics, European studies. And, and I was thinking about this as a kind of a European book in a way, um, yeah, I don't know about like a, a, a post -Ar Northern Ireland book. Um, I was thinking about it more in terms of a European book and certainly obviously the question of a United Ireland is, is hovering in there as well. And that's something that, you know, we'll see how that all develops. Um, so I think it was more that I was struck by the questions that the book raises and um, it certainly doesn't give us any definitive answers, but I think it invites us to be part of that kind of um, consideration and that discussion. So, so this, uh, it's interesting to me, um, you know, you were saying you were joking me, but as full admission now to everyone in the audience, and please send us questions in the Q&A. The two warned me not to ask her any academic questions. And yet, really You're saying- You're going to break that, aren't you? Yeah, I, I've just not, said no, that. But actually, but what I was <laughs> going to say was, what is really wonderful, and what to, uh, you've helped me do in reading the book, and what Dawn has helped me do in her, in her thinking about books, is to think of these books with the due seriousness in their proper context. And I think that you really, I mean, I had such a sense reading the book that you had picked up a frequency that was different to the frequencies I had understood and experienced. And you sort of carry those things with you. And it was really quite a, I felt like something, an opening up actually. Could you imagine like a post or a late troubles and you hear the word troubles and you think, oh God, are we gonna do all this again? Well, it's still there, unfinished, unresolved. We all kind of turned our backs on it. Not, not all of us. Uh, Brexit made us all look at it again for perhaps longer than we wanted to. And yet there's real vibrancy in life in the book. I mean, it's not, it, it was such a, it, it was really a, the gift of it to me reading it was that there was such pleasure. And you talk a little bit about pleasure. I mean, I know we're always talking about north of Ireland, dark, it rains, but you said walk outside. I mean, you're brilliant also. And one thing I want to compliment you on is the pointing to poverty and the fear that that causes. And that's the thing that people don't often talk about in Northern Ireland. Beyond the sectarianism is the poverty and you have this brilliant, bright young person who's actually afraid to go to college because of debt. But tell me a little bit about pleasure and how, how did you write pleasure and why was it important to write about um, Well, I suppose it's there in the book. I, I remember when the book was first picked up. 
up um, by Macmillan and they the, the editor there was sort of saying you know it's really good how you know we look for books that will hold young readers with care we don't want to leave people devastated particularly if they're teenagers you know if, if you're working in adult literary fiction you know you can do what you like with an ending and leave someone devastated with young adult literature one of the kind of rules is your characters might not have a perfect ending but you know they, they don't all die in the end or, or something horrific you know um and it, it my processing of that back to her was actually um, I didn't want to write something that that was devastating about this city of Derry, because sometimes people from outside go, oh, Derry, that's horrendous. And that's not my experience at all of life in Derry, particularly, you know, in, in the last sort of 10, 15 years. I find this a radically progressive city, despite its hardships. And, and it has, you know, many deep hardships and poverty is one of those. And the legacy of violence and the troubles is another. Um, and it, you know, it would have been not a correct narrative for me to not have those things in it. But at the same time, the positivity in this city that I genuinely see, particularly in the field of peace work, that people will reach out the hand and say, look, you might be completely different to me, but let's sit down in a room and, and let's do an event together and, and let's let's see, can we move forward? Because actually we're human. We have a lot in common here. We want the place to work. Um, and I suppose in, in a bigger context, in the field of peace building, the, the population dynamics in Derry are pretty much what you would have if you had a United Ireland in terms of the main traditional communities and the percentages. So some people look look at this city uh, and say, well, if we can get things to work in Derry, if we can solve the big issues and, and get everybody respecting everyone, there's a model that we can use. Obviously, that's a political way of looking at it, and, and not everybody would share that opinion. But that positivity that can do that sense of there is hope even in difficult situations and possibly because of difficult situations there is hope um and also the the, the strength of cultural vibrancy in this city are all things that to me needed to be in there um and i guess it, if i'm trying to write something i try to write it in a balanced way um yes you're showing where the drama is but you need to show where the normal and the good stuff is too, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I was really struck, you know, whenever we had this conversation, I say we, a group of people, friends, we were talking about what kind of books would be on border literature. What would you want to read that you hadn't read before? And your book was suggested several times by different people. And Dawn actually was one of the people who you're great advocates. And I know people like Bernie McGill and your friend who popped on to the Zoom mistake, I think, beforehand, who's also very welcome and is here now. Uh, and the Irish Writers' Centre gave you great support early on. Would you tell me a little bit, I mean, for people who are also out there who are beginning to write, who, like you, didn't imagine themselves as being writers, and still now wonder why professors and doctors are asking you questions about this book that you wrote about a place that you love. Tell me a little bit about that community and about that kind of all Ireland, because it's not a political one, but it is a real all Ireland of solidarity, of friendship, of mutuality and encouragement. Do you mind telling us a little bit? Some um, of your there? Yeah, so, I mean, w when I started writing in summer 2016, I didn't tell anyone um, because there was that thing of, you know, you have to come out as a writer. It took me about 18 months. I'd actually got a full first draft of a book written. Um, and probably only my son actually knew I was writing a novel because he couldn't escape it. Um, but when, when I got to the end of that, you know, I thought, right, I think actually I have something that's the, the genesis of something here. It might need a lot of work. I have a lot of learning about the, the literary scene, about editing, about all sorts of stuff to learn. But how do I take myself on that learning curve? And I couldn't actually find much support locally. Um, actually, you've named Bernie McGill was a mentor to me at, at that point, and and she's up the road in Port Stewart. That was the closest real connection. Um, but the, there was one other writer locally, Dave Duggan. I don't know if you know Dave Duggan, um, but I had known him from peace building work, um, and he was very helpful over a mug of tea. Signposted me to the Irish Writer Centre. And the rest, they say, is kind of history because I connected in first with a, an ex-borders project that Maria McManus, the poet, was running with Patsy Horton. Yeah. Um, got onto that, kind of chanced my arm, I think, to get onto it really, you know, because I didn't have much writing experience. But that started to connect me. And I learned the real value in 
Uh, if you're an emerging writer, you've got to network with other writers. You've got to find the connections, go out of your way, go to the writing festivals, find a writing group. If there isn't a writing group, set up a writing group, um, go on courses um, and get mentoring and learn. And I suppose come to it with the humility of realizing you will have a sharp learning curve. And I'm glad I naively didn't know how competitive uh, the, you know, the world of writing was and how deep the slush piles were for people trying to get agents. I knew none of that when I started writing, um, but I was able to find it all out. A lot of Googling, a lot of the information's free online. Um, and so it was connections through that. And then the breakthrough was ultimately after a learning a lot about self-editing and putting the manuscript through a lot of work. Um, fired it into a couple of competitions and, and it was listed in the Caledonia, but the, re the real one was the Irish Writers' Centre Novel Fair. Um, and that's like a dragon's den and you get to pitch your novel to about 15 agents and publishers and that's where it got picked up and that, that's what lifted it. So, yeah. yeah. Now you say that very blithely there, but if it was like the dragon's den, you must have been terrified when you went in. What was that day like? Do you want the story behind that really? Now? So you don't tell a soul, like, you know, but actually I, w I was out of my head on anti-malarials because I had done, ex I did everything wrong, everything about learning how to write. I did it wrong, you know, um, but with that particular event, I sponsor a kid in Togo and I'd had the opportunity the week before to go to Togo. Um, and so I had come back from Togo, having had a brilliant time, met the, the kids and his family and, and communities, learned a lot and came back to Ireland and I was so ill. Um, so I was really ill and I was still in anti-malarials um, and I barely slept the night before. I had read, read through my novel on the plane on the way back and everything and just about was kind of keeping awake and really ran on adrenaline that entire day. But I think because of that, it was like just all or nothing, throw it all out there and just let it be what it is. And it seemed to work, so. Yeah, I know well, that's a suitable, fitting story. That's Whereas wonderful. if you ask Michelle Gallen, she had prepped perfectly for yeah, it. Yeah. So if you want to know really how to yeah. prep, ask Michelle Gallen. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned Maria McManus. I mean, there's so many great poets and writers out there. And um, I do have a sense even from social media by encouraging everyone as of each other. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to observe. Brilliant. Kudos to everybody who was part of that positive community. Don, did you want to ask you a question then? And I know we've been asked a question in the chat that I will follow up with. And if anybody else wants to send us a question, do through the Q&A. Otherwise, you'll be listening to me golder on for the next 20 minutes. So here's your chance. But Don, please. Um, yeah, I do have a question, actually. So, Sue, so you're originally from Armagh and now you're in Derry. So you've obviously lived in two very different kind of border communities, border counties. And I was wondering, do you think of yourself as a borderlander? How does that shape you as a writer? How does that inform your writing? Um, I, I've lived almost equally long in both places. I mean, the last time I, I fully lived in Armagh was when I was 18 before I went to university. So um, I, I feel a real sense of connection to both places. And actually, uh, if I'm allowed a blatant plug, I mean, the next novel, Truth Be Told, is set in both places because they were the only two places. Uh, very good. <laughs> Thank you. They were the only two places I could go in lockdown, really, that you could access toilets and accommodation at a time when everything was shut. One was my mom's house and the other was my house. Um, so, yeah, I connect with both. Uh, where where I spent most of my adult life is Derry, so it was natural for me to write here. Um, but yes, Arma is more rural. Um, it has a different dynamic. It's a smaller town. Um, I think it, whilst there's still a history of the troubles, it's not quite as in your face, although it's still pretty strong in Arma. Um, but yeah, I... I suppose I'm just a, a, a writer who is who they are. I'm not trying to be anything in particular. I, I just go where the stories are. And I think if there's a pattern to what I write and what I'm interested in, it's how do you write fiction set in the context of a specific time span of, of Northern mm -hmm. Irish context and, you know, um, so my, I'm imagining, my, I can't see myself writing a historical novel going backwards to the Troubles. I think the time spans will keep moving forwards. Interesting, yeah, yeah. 
I have so, a follow up on that, if you don't mind, um, since you just mentioned about writing about Northern Ireland within a specific kind of contemporaneous setting. We didn't really get a chance to talk much about the kind of centenary of 1916. That's also yeah. very much a feature of this book. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a bit about that. I thought that the scene when Iona and Aidan are looking at the, the museum exhibition and thinking about um, sort of identifying with young people a hundred years ago and, and how that would kind of have affected them if, if they had lived at that time. I thought that was really brilliant. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit. Yeah, more and that. I mean, all a lot of the, the backdrops are true. So not just the places that, that I happen to have set scenes, but that was a real exhibition that was in the city hall uh, um, and, and even the watercolor that's on the, the wall with the Irish proverb, yeah. you know, those are real things that, that existed as was the barbecue with the Syrian refugees up in Rosemount, various things that are there in the backdrops um, were real events at that time. Um, yeah, I suppose that putting that scene in was a way to show them reflecting 100 years back, but was also specifically there because I was conscious of the reason I set the book in 2016 was because it was 100 years on from that. Um, and that I knew I wanted to do and I knew that I wanted to have characters that hadn't lived a single day of the troubles so by default their age was 18 and I didn't actually even set out to write a young adult novel um, I just wrote the novel I wanted to write um, and it just happened that they needed to be that age to fit the the dynamics of that um, so yeah, to me, it was important that I suppose the novel is just maybe it's because it's also a tool for peace building or for dialogue or conversation or, or thought um, in that we were doing a lot of work and still are doing a lot of work in communities to bring people together to try and promote that empathy, the engagement with different identities and stuff. And, and that's always been a key part of peace building work. But there's always a lot of people that don't come to community events and the thought was there that you know with a book you can reach a completely different audience in a completely different way so why not try yeah that's also brilliant it should really has it been or will it be like a, a city read i imagine the other books that they have in dublin like that they pick for the year that everybody reads it should be that for oh be. i've no idea i know it's been used in the four corners festival in belfast as a peace building conversation so i'm, I'm always open to that as well as the literary side of things yeah. on it well maybe if there's the mayor of derry london derry is watching this evening the mayor can pick this up as the book of the year it would do everybody good now, we have uh, wonderful questions thank you for them I can't do the data laws and say your names, but it's a pleasure to see the names of people that I know asking these wonderful questions. So thank you for them. And the first of them is, I suppose, a question about character and setting. I mean, we're so um, tuned in to reading, you know, the Protestant character, the Catholic character. So is there any way still residual, even after all this time, that the characters are also symbolic of their communities? in the broader sense, even though it's almost impossible to draw such things. But I mean, is there something in the young male character, something in the young female character that is also representative? Or to what degree are they representative of their cultures, too, do you think? Um, well, I think, you know, like on the back cover, when they're labelled as, you know, Catholic, Irish, Republican, or, or yeah, yeah. Protestant yeah. and British, um, you know, very much Northern Irish characters have to be simplified to Catholic and Protestant almost from marketing terms so oh, that okay. people who aren't as familiar with here can can put a label on it as the yeah. simplest way to understand it. Um, and I think Aidan on I own, I mean, Aidan isn't religious. He's not really religious at all. He might be spiritual and, you know, in some places in the book, but really he's more the politically, historically motivated character, whereas Iona, her faith is a part of who she is. Um, so they they don't fit the you know the the stereotype in every single way, and I don't think either they don't represent every single young person uh, that lives in this city. Never mind people in the north of Ireland. There are a lot of young people that don't fit those categories at all. In peace work, I could give you a statistic of it's about twenty to twenty five percent of young people refuse to put themselves in those boxes, even when they're asked to tick something on a form. They're just like no. Um, no. And that's good, <laughs> you know. That's, so I think the dynamic is changing, but I do think um, 
that, I mean, we still have a very segregated housing system and a very segregated education system. Only 7% of young people in the north of Ireland are actually in an integrated school and maybe tack on about another 3% that are in fairly mixed schools that aren't classified as integrated. That leaves 90%. Um, so yeah, there are still community identities. What I'm also interested in doing, uh, but it's a fine line as a white writer, is to include black and minority ethnic characters and LGBT characters and people who whose identities don't fit fully in boxes in the books, you know. Yeah, no, no, thank you. And it comes out, as Donna pointed out, that certainly comes out. You're reminding me about the, the marketing part of things that I watched the film Belfast. Which actually I enjoyed, but I thought really they should have called it Newton Abbey for all that Belfast was in it. it was <laughs> kind of, um, so it's interesting how these places morph. Now, for all the diversity of the characters, there's a question here also about the character of Shannon and what was the motivation in describing her? Um, well, I, I think you need to have a bit of a, an anti-hero or which is maybe not in, quite in that field, but um, there's a sense of a love triangle as well at the start. You, you have to have things that don't make things work smoothly. Um, and Shannon would represent a type of character that certainly is true. I mean, all the characters in, in this book are quite deliberately chosen to, to represent certain things uh, as well as have a role in the book, you know. Um, so for me, you know, Shannon, I suppose... Shannon mirrors what Aidan might have been if he didn't make right choices. Um, Shannon shows that she's, she's from the same community. She's from the same kind of poverty levels um, and her life choices are not that dissimilar maybe to Aidan's, but ultimately she's not going on the right path for whatever reason. And, and he, so it shows you the, the tightrope that Aidan is walking to an extent mm -hmm. as well, I think, you know, but uh, characters, some of the sub characters that I really love. I mean, I love Paddy in that book and I know so many Paddies in this city, you know, who who have had a, maybe a political ex-prisoner background or, or, you know, got involved in stuff in the troubles and they're just the heart and soul of their communities or their families now and trying to make a difference. And that's on both sides of the, the divide, if you like. Yeah. Um, you know, or or his nan over the border. I mean, God love her. She's brilliant. You know, so so all the subsidiary characters, or even Andy, um, as Iona's brother, so important. I think to have a character who represents the the Protestant British tradition and and ultimately has something positive and to say about that and positive in who he is and the choices that ultimately he makes, because so often some of those on both sides are vilified in literature and how they're presented, you know? Mm. Yeah, I'm sometimes slightly puzzled, um, you know, by this, maybe this is naive of me or foolish to say, but you know, this idea that Britishness would not survive Northern Ireland's end. And, you know, maybe one of the longer decouplings might be that that you know, a cultural sense of Britishness, uh, certainly something I was growing up in very much. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the future of Northern Ireland as a, separate partition place you know and maybe those decades between the good friday agreement and brexit mm. show there was this kind of overlapping place with these mixed identities where in fact people could live could prosper could be comfortable and could be beside each other so your book asks us those deep questions now i'm going to come back to you and i'm going to ask you at the end to a question about where you are now because you're not the writer you are now that you were at the beginning of all this and just to think about what the future will bring but don in kind of Closing or coming towards a closing, if you have any last question for Sue, please do ask it. But there's a wonderful question from the audience, and it's about there are a lot of young female protagonists in recent fiction from the North. Michelle Gallen, Susanna Dickey, Anna Burns, wonderful, Jan Carson, whose new novel is excellent, I'm looking forward to reading. Um, why is this happening now? Gosh, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it certainly seems to be, it is this recent phenomenon, and um, I, I suppose an, it's an opening up of looking at, at girlhood, and female experience, how that shifted. Um, I, I think, for me, something that struck me is so much of kind of troubles literature was to do with masculinity 
and was very much focused on how that was shaped by political circumstances, by paramilitarism. And so uh, perhaps that's the reason for this shift is that there was an appetite for hearing more about girlhood, coming of age, um, female experience, um, because we haven't heard a whole lot about it. Um, you know, when we would hear about it, they were often minor characters, they were just thinly sketched out, um, or, you know, they were kind of sketched in relation to the male characters. And so I think that's something that's, um, we've had a kind of massive shift recently, and it's very welcome um, to see, but also certainly the explosion, as I said, of, of contemporary Northern women's writing, um, you know, women are writing about women characters and, and, and girl characters. And that's been really exciting to see as well. Um, so that's something that I enjoyed about Sue's book was I felt that there was an interesting balance of looking at how gender identity was shaped in this kind of post-conflict context. And did you want to ask Sue any final questions before we come forward to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, I. I was interested in something that Aidan said at another, I mean, there's so many, it's very highly quotable book. There's so many <laughs> great uh, phrases that popped up, but something that Aidan said, I thought was really interesting that kind of ties into some of the discussion that we've had is um, that for him, peace means life beyond labels. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit because peace has very much shifting definitions in the book um, according to the different characters' perspectives. Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody, well, everybody's always a generalization. Many people in Northern Ireland, um, you know, if, if you go to so many events, if you take part in a community project, you literally have to tick boxes as to your identity so people can track whether it's cross community for funding. And and, and I'm even part of that system in, in my day job. And so many people hate it. And I think, you know, I have always struggled to put labels on me because I, I don't fit them. And, and if I say one label, people will assume five other labels and, and four of them could be completely untrue for me. So many people struggle with having to fit a box and, and Northern Ireland sometimes doesn't allow you to not fit a box because it doesn't work for all that stuff that people have to do. So yeah, for Aidan, you know, he probably, you know, he's not, Catholic in the sense of having a deep faith at all, but he's Irish and, and he's Republican, but he's not necessarily a Republican that wants a load of return to violence. So even that in itself, you know, and I think he does question, uh, you know, what it is to be a man in, in this scenario that he's in as well. And, you, you know, you see him grappling with that. Does Iona want him to fight the people that attacked her or what should he do? You know, um, so, I, you know, I like where he says, that she was writing, rewriting his textbook uh, on, on girls and, and how he processed that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. that's very much part of it. And I think that kind of discussion around patriarchy is probably something that travels a lot more into book two, which is not a sequel, but similar kind of, you know, contemporary gritty teen context of Northern Ireland. Um, that's much more what I explore in the next book, but yeah, the, the inklings of it were there. So as we uh, draw to a close this evening, I wanted to thank everyone in the audience for taking the time to be with us and for celebrating and enjoying this wonderful book by Sue. It is a great achievement. I'm sure the first of many great achievements in your writing career. And I know you're too modest uh, to think about yourself necessarily in these contexts. We're all grateful for the work that you do and excited to read more of it. And thank you for that. And Don, thank you too for always adding your sharp insight critical intelligence and your great um, understanding of these complicated works in the widest possible context. I've learned a great deal from it and I'm grateful to you for it. Thank you everyone in the National Library as well. We have two more events left in our Border Literature series. One is on Wednesday the 16th of February when Stephen O'Neill, Maria Johnson and Gail McConnell will be talking about Seamus Heaney. And on Wednesday 23rd of March when Martin Doyle will be chairing a conversation about the New Horizons book with James Patterson, Jill Crawford, wonderful writer, Needy Zach, and Luke Cassidy. So, two more things to look forward to. But 
in closing up this evening, Sue, you are now in a very different place than you were when you thought you were bored of an evening after your busy life and you were tired and you're filling in grant applications and you're a force for good in your community and you wrote this book and life has changed for you and you're thinking about writing fictions into the future. Would you tell me a little bit about what you're, if you don't mind, because it's so much of our conversation about the North is about the past, but what are your hopes for the future? as a writer? What are your dreams for the future as a writer? What kind of characters do you hope to speak with into the future? Um, well, I would love to see us beginning to talk more about the environmental issues, you know, that, that Dawn had, had mentioned. I think that context is, it's a unifying thing de facto, because we'll not be here if we don't address this. And I hope that at some point the dynamic will shift, that we will move uh, to the bigger picture of some of those things. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in diversity within our communities and how we write that. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's hard uh, as a white writer um, and as a straight writer to, 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 to write that in a way that isn't appropriate in somebody else's story, but yet at the same time to make sure that whatever I write is inclusive um, and, and showing that diversity. Um, so yeah, I think I, I do still love writing teenagers. So I, I think I probably will stick with YA. Um, I love flash fiction as well. I tend to do other stuff with that, but yeah, I, I think I probably will stick with YA and try and plot the stories of teenagers in various scenarios. And definitely that's what there's more of in, in Truth Be Told, the second book and the third book still in here somewhere being mulled over, but I think it'll be less the Protestant Catholic thing and more social environmental. Well, wonderful. Thank you. You've been so kind. And myself, living with three teenagers who I love dearly, maybe writing about them rather than living with them might be a little bit of an easier job. But thank you very much for being so kind and generous to share your time. It's such a pleasure uh, to sit with you as the author of the work and to talk about your brilliant book. There are lots of lovely comments coming into the conversation from the side. And Don, thank you so much for being with us. So thank you, everyone. And we will see you on February the 16th when Border Literatures will continue. Thank you.